for today. This is going to be the tutorial for the Animation Recreation 2. That is our third assignment for the term. And uh, speaking of assignments, before we dive into what we're doing today, I will be spending a little bit of time just discussing or going over the active assignments that we have at the end of week five, which is what uh, week we're currently in now. So if you have had any questions or any confusion with regards to the assignments, please do just jump to the end of this video as well so you can listen to me just explain that too. Okay. So then to dive straight into our animation, remember we made our assets as homework. So we're just gonna dive straight into After Effects and start animating those. I'm gonna click on new project, new composition. And the only thing we need to worry about changing here is our duration. We're gonna make sure that that is two seconds and 12 frames long. Got a nice short duration for today. And we just say, okay. We're then gonna bring in our visual reference footage. So that's file, import, file and grabbing the video reference footage that we've downloaded from Canvas. That gets added to our project panel. And then again, file, import, file, and we'll grab the Illustrator assets that we've made as well. For the, uh, it's gonna be one of those days, sorry. For the Illustrator assets, please remember to change import as from footage to composition retain layer sizes, and then say open. We can then double click on the composition highlighted in the project panel and we're now looking at our assets. All right. Now, obviously, there wasn't a sort of um, template for these assets. So there's a good chance that your shapes aren't necessarily the same size as mine or not necessarily the same size as they are in the reference footage. So the first thing we can do to fix that is to simply drag our video footage down to the bottom of the layer timeline. We're going to increase its scale to 334%. That fills the entire screen. I'm also just gonna turn off its visual reference here and lock it. And then if we come out to two seconds, nine frames on the timeline, if I just move my shapes out the way, you'll then be able to see each of the shapes at their largest sizes in their final resting place. So this is a good opportunity then to just scale your assets accordingly so that we then uh, actually can follow along to the reference footage. So if you do need to do that, take a little bit of time and then continue with the video. We're gonna dive forward from here. Okay, so once you've got your assets scaled up to the correct size in our visual reference, what we're gonna do is just quickly uh, order our layers and then we can begin making things move. We're gonna put our visual reference at the very top of the timeline. I'm just gonna turn that off and lock it there. Then our second layer is going to be the base. So that's our second lowest, uh, our lowest layer here. Um, below base is going to be the blue circle. So that's gonna be on layer three, then the rounded rectangle, then the square, then the black circle. So we're gonna be moving down the list, animating these layers in order. I'm just gonna set the base as a nice green for today. Blue circle, can obviously just give it blue. Rounded rectangle, let's make purple. Square, that's already yellow, so we'll make that yellow as well. And then the black circle, I'm gonna make orange for today. All right, and with that, our assets are now set up and ready to begin moving. We are then going to just turn off the visibility for all of our layers except the base. And we'll turn on our visual reference once again. Now, just as we did last week, what we're gonna be doing is using our rulers in order to help us plot out things on the viewing panel. To bring up your rulers, you either hit Command or Control R, or you come up to View and you simply turn rulers on here. We're also gonna be making use of our timeline indicators to plot things out on our timeline. Okay, so, Taking a look at what we're gonna be making today, you'll see that we start off with our base and our large circle, which then grows larger after a point of impact. It does, um, our base does have this sort of coin flip effect going on here. That's because I believe in the original reference, these assets were actually 3D. We're only working with 2D assets, so we're not gonna be recreating this coin effect. We're just going to be animating our flat shape, moving straight up and down. All right, we then have those shapes all popping into existence and landing on top of each other. And then the last thing that we have are these secondary elements that are all shooting out after that point of contact. So we'll spend the last couple of minutes of the tutorial making those. Okay, so for now, what we're gonna do is we are going to just start off at the very beginning of the timeline. I'm gonna create my first keyframe indicator. The reason why I'm placing it here is that the number of markers I create will then also be the number of position keys that we'll be using. So it'll be easier for you guys to track as well. And we're also gonna put a ruler down and just place it at the bottom of our base there. All right, let's zoom in here and plot this out. 
So our base then moves down and gets to its lowest position at frame 15. So I'm going to place another ruler down on frame 15 and I'll create a timeline marker there. Then it starts to lift itself back up into the air and it gets to its highest point at frame 22 before the big ball lands on it and knocks it down a peg again. So at frame 22, we're going to have another ruler guide as well as another timeline marker. Moving on over to frame 24, I'll have a new guide and a new timeline marker so we remember to make that change there. And then finally, rather than doing this flip, we're just going to have it shifting up in position and that gets to its resting point at 1 second 20 frames. And it's kind of slightly higher than our starting position was. So I'll just place another ruler down there just so it doesn't start and end in the same position. All right. So with that done, we can then turn off our visual footage. We're going to come on over to the very beginning of the timeline and select layer 2. We'll hit P for position and we're going to create our first keyframe. We can go ahead and just preemptively apply easing to that keyframe as well by hitting F9 on the keyboard. Moving down the timeline, oh, before I get ahead of myself, we obviously want to move this to its actual starting position. So I'm just going to zoom in here and I'm going to get it to rest just on that second lowest guide there. All right, so that's our first starting position. Then moving over to frame 15, this is where our shape moves down, gets to its lowest point. I'm going to zoom in here and just leave my view there. And just resting on that guide. And we need to remember to grab our convert vertex tool that's hiding underneath the pen tool and removing our handles. Pretty much all of our shapes are just moving straight up and down today. So we're going to have to do that for all of them. Moving along the timeline then to frame 22, our shape then moves back up and it's now going to be resting on this third highest reference line here. And we're going to apply toggle hold to this keyframe by right clicking on it and selecting toggle hold keyframe. The reason being is because the next movement that occurs at frame 24, if we take a look at our reference footage, there's no change in movement between frame 23 and 24, it just suddenly jumps into its new position. So that's why we will then have toggle hold to make sure that it just jumps like that. Move our shape down on frame 24 to be resting on our second lowest guide. You'll see that your keyframe is a square. And that's because toggle hold keyframe is still being applied. So we're going to then apply easing to our fourth keyframe just by hitting F9 there. And that's going to allow our shape to then rise up until one second 20 frames when it gets to the top of its resting point. All right, so with that, it looks a little bit strange playing it back with this little jump that we have here, but contextually, once we see that big ball landing on top of it, that'll make sense. With this done, we can then select any one of these keyframes and let's dive into the graph editor. Cool, so we're gonna have a large peak over the first keyframe. That's so that our first movement occurs quite quickly and then it eases into that next position. Keyframe two, I'm gonna push my handles as far as I can to either side to help facilitate creating peaks over keyframe one and keyframe three. We need our second peak over keyframe three. Not too sharp, maybe not as intense as this, but definitely a little bit of a peak like that. This allows it to then ease out of that position and start rising quickly. It then bounces into position and for this last loop that we have here, I'm just going to zoom in and shift across the timeline a bit. We're going to move our handles ever so slightly just to create some easing. So it's going to ease out of its position, speed up over this course of time, and then ease into its final position. All right, so your graph is going to look something like this. Peak over the first frame, trough over the second, peak over the third, and then slight speed bump being made between the fourth and fifth. And with that, we are done with this shape, at least. We can select our base and collapse and lock it. Let's also come up and clear all of our viewing guides. So view, clear guides, and we can get rid of our timeline markers by just right clicking on one of them and selecting delete all markers. And that then clears our timeline there. Next up, we're going to be doing our blue ball next. So let's turn on the visibility for layer three. Let's turn on the visibility for our reference layer and let's see what happens. 
So the blue ball along with the yellow square and rounded rectangle all appear for the first time at the one second mark on the timeline. They're kind of shooting up from inside, I suppose you could say, or from behind this shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our starting keyframe one frame before it actually pops up on screen. The reason we want to do this is so that it's actually already moving when we first see it. it just makes it a little bit easier on the eyes to follow the motion involved and um, it helps clear up any issues we might have when working with the graph editor. So I'm going to place a timeline marker on frame 24 and then we're going to just move along the timeline and see what this blue ball does. So it pops into the air and it gets to the top of its jump at, I would call it one second, seven frames. I'm gonna place a ruler down just to see the bottom of that shape there. And I'll place a timeline marker at one second, seven frames. It holds this position until one second, nine frames. So we're gonna have an empty position keyframe at one second, nine frames. And then it begins to fall. It lands on the base below it at one second, 15 bounces up into the air at one second, 17 frames. I'm gonna place a guide down there. And then it holds that position until one second, 19 frames, and comes back to rest at one second, 20. So what we could do is we could just have a single keyframe at the end that brings it back down. But I think what we did in class was we had an empty position keyframe on one second, 19, and a new keyframe on one second, 20. So we're just gonna follow that method still. All right, so now we've plotted this out. Let us then turn off our visual reference layer, grab our blue ball, and we'll come over to frame 24 and hit P for position and create our first position keyframe. You can also go ahead and just apply easing to that. Now we are going to start with our shape just sitting halfway on the screen at the bottom here. The tree just disappearing halfway off. The reason why we're doing this is so I can show you how we could then hide these shapes at the very end but all of our shapes are gonna start just peeking up here on screen. Okay, and that's at frame 24. Moving down the timeline to one second, seven frames, our blue ball then jumps into the air, just using my arrow keys to help make with that movement. Grab my convert vertex tool and remove my handles so that I don't have to worry about those. That then has our shape bouncing into the air. Then moving over to one second, nine frames, there's no change in position. So you can either copy and paste your second position keyframe or coming over to the far left of the timeline, we can also click on the empty keyframe button there and that generates a keyframe for us. Moving along to one second, 15 frames, our ball then moves straight down and it comes into contact with the, round, or with the base rather at one second, 15 frames. It then bounces right back up into the air and is now resting on our lowest guide. Holds that position until one second, 19 frames. So we'll have an empty position keyframe at one second, 19. And then it comes back down to rest at one second, 20 frames, landing on the base. And uh, that's the end of its movement there. Okay, so first key has it sitting halfway off screen, second key up into the air third key is an empty keyframe. It then falls and makes contact for the fourth, bounces up for the fifth, holds until the sixth, and then lands on the seventh keyframe. Diving into the graph editor, this is gonna look somewhat similar to what we were doing for our base. First off, starting with a peak over the first keyframe. That makes sure that our ball shoots into the air quite quickly. Then our next peak is going to be on our point of contact. So that's gonna be our fourth keyframe on one second, 15 frames. I'm gonna pinch my handles in on top of that fourth keyframe and use the corresponding handles to either side of it to create that massive peak there. All right, and then lastly, this little loop that we have at the end, because that's only taking place over a single frame, we don't have to worry about that no changes that we make to this would actually be perceptible because of how short it takes place. So as long as we have a peak over our first keyframe and a peak over our fourth keyframe, we should be good. Playing that back, our ball shoots up into the air, bounces quite forcefully, and then comes to rest. Exactly what we're looking for. All right, let's leave the graph editor here and lock our blue circle. 
I'd recommend that you save. Don't want to risk losing our work. I'm just going to overwrite a file from this week's class, but do save that as something new and put it somewhere safe. All right. With that, let's come on up to view and clear all of our guides. Let's also get rid of all of our timeline markers. And we're going to be doing our rounded rectangle next. So once again, rounded rectangle appears on the one second mark. So we're going to have our first keyframes on frame 24. It's also been scaled down quite a bit and it's rotating. So we're going to be working on that as well. But let's focus on position first. So it shoots up into the air and it gets to the top of that jump at about one second, 10 frames. There's no more sort of vertical movement there. It's just rotating in the air. So I'm going to put my second timeline marker at one second, 10 frames. I'm not going to put a ruler down just yet. Moving over, it then starts falling from one second, 16 frames. So at one second, 16 frames, I'll place another marker. That's going to be an empty keyframe. And now it's a little bit more horizontal, so I can kind of place a guide here, just touching its middle, getting a sense of where that would be there. All right, moving down the timeline, it then lands on our blue ball for the first time, even though there's a bit of a visual gap there, we'll actually have them touching each other. And that happens at one second, 20 frames. It then bounces up into the air at one second, 22. So I'm going to put another ruler down just to remind me that there needs to be a subtle lift there. And I'll put a timeline marker at one second, 22 frames to remind me that that's where it jumps up. And then it comes to rest at one second, 24 on the blue circle again. So at one second, 24 frames, I'll then have my sixth timeline marker there. All right. Let's do our initial movements and then we can do rotation and scaling. So once again, coming on over to frame 24, we're going to hit P for position and create our first position keyframe. And then going to hit F9 and apply easing to that. And our shape is also going to start down here at the bottom, just poking up halfway on the screen. Moving along to one second, 10 frames. This is where our shape shoots up into the air and it's roughly resting on that highest guide that we've made there. I'm gonna grab our Convert Vertex tool and remove our handles. Don't forget to do that. It then holds this position until one second, 16 frames. So we're gonna have an empty position keyframe at one second, 16. Moving over to one second, 20, it then falls down and lands on our blue ball for the first time. Moving over to one second, 22 frames, it then bounces up into the air slightly. Just so we see a visual difference there. And then finally it comes to rest at one second, 24 frames, and then ceases to move from there. All right, so with that, we've got our six position keyframes. We'll dive into the graph editor and just do these as well. Once again, we need a peak over the very first keyframe so that our shape shoots up onto the screen. And just as with the blue ball, we are now going to have our second peak occurring with our fourth keyframe. That's where it makes contact with the blue ball for the first time. So that means it will be hanging in midair, losing its fight to gravity, picking up speed as it then hits the ball and shoots back up off of it. And then what we'll do for this final loop here is we're just going to make a peak over the sixth keyframe as well. So it just lands quite forcefully. All right. So that's a peak over the first frame, peak over the fourth and peak over the sixth. Let's come on out of the graph editor and just save again. And now we can do our scaling and rotation. All right. So <clears throat> just moving over to frame 24, I'm going to hold down shift and hit R for rotation. And while holding shift, I'm also going to hit S for scale. First thing we're going to do is unlink our scale values. And we're going to decrease our first scale value to roughly 30%. Now, obviously, your values might be different to mine if you were scaling it at the beginning of the tutorial. So just so that it's kind of peeking out from behind that blue ball will be good. Okay, we're going to make our first scale keyframe here. And we can go ahead and apply easing to that as well. Taking a look at our visual reference, 
our shape gets to its largest size at about one second 15 frames doesn't seem to grow any further beyond that point so at one second 15 frames i'm then just going to increase my scale back up to its original starting size so your two values will probably be the same again there and that just guarantees that we've got some nice scaling occurring while it's jumping up into the air Doing rotation next, we'll do the easing for the scale in a moment. Let's make our first rotation keyframe on frame 24, and that reads zero times zero degrees. We can go ahead and apply easing to that as well. Taking a look at our reference, our shape then stops rotating on frame one second 19 frames. That's where it comes into a full horizontal. So at one second, 19 frames on the timeline, I'm going to change my rotation value from zero times zero to one times zero. That means that it's going to do one full rotation before um, it then comes to rest. So if you scrub back now, you should see it doing a full 360 degree rotation. All right. With that, we're going to grab our scale keyframe and already having applied easing to it, let's dive into the graph editor. We're going to make sure that a majority of the change occurs quite quickly. So we want a fairly sharp peak on the left and that has our scale shooting quite quickly as it's jumping into the air. We're going to do the same thing for the rotation. So taking rotation into the graph editor, we're going to have a peak on the left hand side. And this just means that most of the rotation occurs while it's scaling and jumping into the air, coming to rest as it then lands. All right, and with that, our rounded rectangle is now done. Once again, we can save. Let's come up to view and clear all of our guides and let's get rid of all of our timeline markers. We can collapse and lock layer four and let's turn on layer five, our yellow square. Taking a look at our visual reference, once again, we're gonna have our first keyframes starting on frame 24. Our yellow square shoots into the air while rotating. And it gets to the top of that jump at about, I'd say about one second, 15 frames. So I'm just gonna place a general guide down there at one second, 15 frames. It holds that position and only starts falling again from 1 second 19. So we're going to place a timeline mark at 1 second 18 frames. So that will allow it to start falling there. And then it lands on the rounded rectangle at 1 second 24 frames. So we'll place a timeline marker there. And zooming in, just to take a look here, the shape then bounces up into the air at 2 seconds. So another timeline marker at the two second point and a ruler just to show that there should be a little bit of change. It holds this position until two seconds, three frames, and then it lands at two seconds, four frames. All right. And we'll have seven keyframes for the square. Turning off our visual reference, let's grab our square. I'm going to hit P for position and hold down shift and hit R for rotation. I'll make my first position keyframe at frame 24 and I'm going to apply easing to that. But I'm also then going to adjust my rotation without making a keyframe. Just so I'm looking at an actual square for now. That's just going to make placing it on that guide a little bit easier. I'll come back and adjust that back to zero once we're done with the positioning keys. All right. So as with all the other shapes, our shape is going to be sitting at the bottom of the screen, just halfway there, disappearing behind the blue ball and the rounded rectangle. We're then going to move over to one second, 15 frames, and that's where our shape has jumped up into the air. Remember to grab our convert vertex tool and to remove our handles. Moving across to one second, 18 frames, we're going to make an empty position keyframe there. And then our square begins to fall. Now I can actually adjust my rotation back to zero so that I can see its corner point. And that's going to allow me to place it a little bit easier here. And obviously my shapes are still a little too large for the reference. So even though this guide here doesn't really show the movement, we're going to move one frame over to two seconds and just shift our shape slightly up 
just so that there's a visual gap there. It then holds that position until two seconds, three frames. So we're gonna make an empty position keyframe. And then we are going to bring it back down to rest at uh, two seconds, four frames. All right, so running through these keyframes, once again, our first keyframe has the yellow square starting off at the bottom of the screen. It then shoots up into the air and gets to the top of its jump at one second, 15 frames. Holds that position until one second, 18, and then begins to fall. Lands on its corner on top of the rounded rectangle at one second, 24 frames. Bounces up into the air at two seconds. Holds that position to two seconds, three frames and then comes to rest at two seconds, four frames. Let's grab any one of our keyframes here and dive into the graph editor. So as with every other shape we've done so far, the first keyframe we're gonna have is gonna have a large peak over it. That's going to cause our shape to shoot up into the air quite quickly. And as with our other shapes, we are then going to have our second peak occurring over the fourth keyframe when it comes in contact with that rounded rectangle there. And that's going to then have it making very fast contact when it lands, bounces back up, holds that position, and once again, that little loop there at the end, nothing that we need to do there because it's only over one frame. All right, so playing that back, we've then got the shape jumping up and coming to rest. Next thing that we can do is our rotation for this square. So coming back to frame 24, we're gonna create an empty rotation keyframe of zero degrees, and we are going to apply easing to that. And then taking a look at our reference, our yellow square gets into its final rotation at, I believe it's one second 20 frames. Well, the one second 21 frames for today. So at one second 21 frames, what I'm gonna do here is exactly as we did for the rounded rectangle, I'm going to create my second rotation keyframe reading one times zero. So that's gonna be one full rotation with zero degrees there. And that means that our shape will do a full rotation while it's jumping into the air. We're gonna grab one of those rotation keys and dive into the graph editor. And exactly as we did for the rounded rectangle, we're going to have a peak on the left so that most of the rotation occurs as it's appearing and then it eases into that final rotation at the end. Okay. And with that, our rounded rectangle, or <laughs> our yellow square is finished. We can then come up and clear all of our guides. Let's get rid of our timeline markers. And the last thing that we then need to do is our black circle layer six okay so let's check out our visual reference and see what happens here so this ball first appears on screen on frame two so we're going to have our first keyframes on frame one you can see that it's already quite small when it jumps on screen so we're gonna to have to do something with its scale as well but it jumps into the air and it gets to the top of that jump at one uh, 15 frames exactly so 15 frames I'm just going to zoom in here and place a ruler down there. Then it falls and it lands on the base at frame 24. That's also when it increases in size. So I'm going to place a timeline marker on frame 24. What I'm also going to do is just to make our positioning a little bit easier, we're going to quickly do our scale change as well. So on frame 24, I'm just gonna select layer six and hit S for scale, and I'll create a keyframe with it currently at its largest size. Right now, mine reads 100, 100. I'm then going to go back one frame to frame 23, and I'm gonna de uh, decrease my size to about 60% of its current size. If you turn on your visual reference, you'll be able to kind of eyeball the size that it needs to be here. And at least this way, we now already have that scale change occurring. So we don't need to worry about doing that later when we're doing our position keys. Turning on our visual footage again, our ball then jumps back up into the air, gets to the top of that jump on frame one second, 12 frames. So we're gonna place a ruler guide down there and a timeline marker of one second, 12 frames. 
Then it holds that position for a couple of frames until one second 14. So it holds that for two frames and then it begins to fall. It lands on the yellow square for the first time at two seconds, four frames. Then bounces back up into the air at two seconds, five frames. Place a ruler down there. And then it comes to rest at two seconds, nine frames. We could have it hold in midair, but you'll see that it's kind of already falling over the course of those four frames. So that's just a very slow fall occurring, not any holding position being made. All right, so with that, we can then turn off our visual reference and let's animate our final layer. Coming on over to frame one on the timeline. I'm gonna hit P for position and create my first position keyframe. And I'll go ahead and apply easing to that. We're gonna start with our big ball also down here at bottom, halfway on the screen. Okay, it then jumps into the air. So at 15 frames, we're going to lift it up and that's going to rest on the second highest guide that we have there. We're going to remember to grab the convert vertex tool and to click and remove our handles before we go any further. Okay, then it holds that position until, no it doesn't actually, it goes straight back up. Just want to see, did I maybe forget a I did forget to place the timeline marker down there, so that's my bad. So it holds that position until frame 18. So we're gonna need an empty position keyframe on frame 18, just so it stays up in the air. And then we need to fall and have it land on our base on frame 24. That coincides with when that base gets knocked down slightly. So now it makes visual sense. Okay, and that's our fourth keyframe. It then bounces directly back up into the air. So we're going to shoot this straight up and it's now going to be resting on our highest guide. Let's get it to about there. It holds that position until one second, 14 frames. So we make an empty position keyframe on one second, 14. And then it begins to fall and it lands on our yellow square at two seconds, four frames. I'm gonna zoom in here and just see how I need to move that. Two seconds, five frames, it then jumps up into the air slightly. So I'm just going to increase it slightly over that guide that we have. And then two seconds, nine frames, bring it back down so that it's touching our yellow square. All right. With that, we can then dive into the graph editor. Once again, we need a strong peak over our first keyframe there, so our ball shoots into the air. We then need our second peak occurring over our third keyframe. Oh, sorry, that's our fourth keyframe there. So that's going to be when it makes contact with the base below on frame 24. If I zoom in and move along. The next peak we need is on two seconds, four frames. So that's when it makes contact on the yellow square for the first time. And then finally, we need a peak over the final keyframe there when it comes to rest. Okay, so peak over the first keyframe, peak over the fourth keyframe when it makes contact, peak over the, I guess that would be the seventh keyframe when it makes contact and peak over the final keyframe when it makes contact. Playing this back, that looks quite nice. Cool. Let's come out of the graph editor and save, and we can collapse and lock layer six. We are now finished making all of our shapes move. I'm gonna clear all of my timeline markers, and I'm also going to remove all of my guides. I'm gonna get rid of my rulers because I also don't need those by just hitting Command and Control R. All right. So the next step is generating our background. What we're gonna do for this is we're going to turn on our visual reference layer just so we can sample that color. Then we are going to come on up to layer, new, and we're going to select a solid. So that's layer, new, solid. That opens up your solid settings here. Just grab the eyedrop tool and sample the color from your background image. That'll then set that nice shade of red and say, okay. 
and that then generates a red solid one at the top of our timeline. I'm gonna rename that to BG1, background one. And I'm gonna drag that to the very bottom of the timeline. If I turn off my visual reference, I can now see that my shapes exist in that same shade of red. Now when we render it, it'll actually have a background color. Okay. Next is to hide these assets that are chilling over here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate background one. So that's currently layer seven. Select that and hit Command or Control D to duplicate. And you'll see that we now have BG2 on layer seven and BG1 on layer eight. I'm gonna lock layer eight and turn off the visibility. And I'm gonna grab BG2 and I'm gonna drag it down until it's just sitting flush with that uh, base over there, like so. We're then going to parent this background layer to the actual base. So we're gonna parent layer seven to layer two. And now whenever that base moves, that background color moves with it. And then we're gonna move layer seven, our background two up the layer stack to sit directly below the base. And that's then going to hide the shapes below it because of our layer hierarchy allowing my shapes there to look as though they're just appearing in thin air when they first appear. All right, turning back on layer eight, that then looks seamless. Playing that back, we now have exactly what we need. All right, so our backgrounds are now made. They're fitting seamlessly together. We can go ahead and lock what is now layer three, background two. We've locked our background layer, layer eight, and now everything fits seamlessly together. Cool. The last thing that we need to do if we turn on our visual reference is we need to do these little streaking elements that are shooting out here. So we're gonna be making use of our pen tool as well as an effect called trim paths. Now, in order to do this, all of our first keyframes are once again gonna be on frame 24. So I'll place a timeline marker there. And we can then first see our streaks appearing on screen at the one second mark. So what we're going to do is we're just going to grab our pen tool that is hiding below our convert vertex tool. And we're going to set our fill to nothing. So we can do that by clicking on the word fill and setting that to the first option here. Then we can click on the word stroke and make sure that that is set to the second option, which is solid color. And let's get the correct shade of yellow. So we're just gonna click on our color picker panel here, grab our eyedrop tool, and we can sample the yellow from our little sliver of the square that's sticking out in our reference footage, and then say, okay. And our point thickness can be five points thick. Okay, now these streaks, if we just take a look at this uh, yellow one here, for example, this first appears on the one second mark but it extends further away. You see that the full extent of the line comes all the way out to here. So what we're gonna do is at the one second mark, we're just gonna click to create our first point. You'll see that that then makes a new shape layer for us called shape layer one. And we can see the point that we've just made now sitting on screen. We're gonna come down the timeline to about one second, 10 frames where we can just see that streak disappearing. And we're gonna to click to create our line there. Okay, then what we're gonna do is, let's just make all of our streaks this time round. In class, we were doing them one at a time. Let's just draw out all of our streaks to begin with. So coming back to the one second mark, I'm gonna lock shape layer one. If I were to keep drawing with the pen tool, it would just add more lines to that layer. We want all of these to be on their own layers for now. So making sure shape layer one is no longer selected. Back at the one second mark, I can then click to create the point for my second yellow streak. I'm gonna move my timeline out to one second, nine frames, where I can just see that last point disappearing and click to create my point there. All right, we can then lock that shape layer two. Let's come back and we're gonna do our purple streaks next. So to get the purple color, we're gonna click on our color box again, grab our eyedrop tool, and let's just sample the purple from any one of these streaks or the donuts. It's all the same purple, really a nice plum color. We'll just say okay for that. I'll click to create my first point, again, making sure that none of my layers are selected. Click to make my first point here. Move down the timeline to see how far that extends all the way to there. So at one second, four frames, we can kind of see the end of that line. 
that gives us our first purple line. I'm going to lock that shape layer and go back to the one second mark. And we'll make our final streak. So click to make our final point or second last point, I guess. And moving down the timeline to when I can see that point disappearing, there's our final point there. All right, so we have now made these layers. We'll come back and do those donut shapes in a moment. Let's treat these four shape layers that have just been made. So first things first, I'm going to select shape layer four, three, two, and one, and we're going to color code these in Fuchsia for today. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to rename each of these. So I'm going to call this streak four, streak three, streak two, and three, streak one. Always good to label our layers. And then the last thing we're going to do before we can apply our trim paths to these layers is we want to move our anchor points onto the actual shapes. If we have any one of these shape layers selected, you'll notice that the anchor points are all sitting in the center of the workspace for any of those. So to center those quickly, I'm just going to select streak four. Holding down command or control, I'm going to double click on the pan behind tool and that then automatically centers its anchor point in the center of the shape. Do the same for streak three, holding command or control, double clicking on the pan behind tool. Same for streak two and same for streak one. At least now these shapes anchor points are in a more relevant position. All right, then we're going to apply trim paths to these shapes and trim paths is going to allow us to create that shooting effect that we see in the reference footage where those lines are stroking away essentially. So we're going to come back to frame 24 and I'm going to open up streak four. You'll see it's inside of streak four. It has contents and transform. And to the right of contents, there is an add option. We're going to click on the little play button next to the word add, and we are going to select trim paths. That then gets added below contents. It's already highlighted for us. We're going to go inside of it and create a start and end keyframe. And we're going to lower the end keyframe value down to 0%. And you'll notice as you click and drag that to zero, my streak four is disappearing there. Okay, and then I can collapse streak four. We've set that one up for now. Let's do the same for streak three. Open it up and apply trim paths. And create a start and end, oops, not offset, start and end keyframes on frame 24, both reading 0%. Do the same for streak two and for streak one. All right, and with that, we can now not see any of our streaks because we've reduced the percentages to zero. And now we can actually animate these. So we're gonna start off with streak one. What I'm gonna do is hit U for uniform. That's gonna hide all this excess information and only show me my keyframes. And I'm just gonna go ahead and apply easing to these. And then going to move down the timeline and we're going to see when this streak disappears. Remember, this is now the streak that I'm working on here, streak one. And that in the reference disappears completely on one second, 12 frames. So I'm just going to put a timeline marker at one second, 12 frames. And then at one second, 12 frames, I'm going to create a start and end keyframe that both read 100%. You'll notice that we still can't see the shape. And we're going to be able to see it actually streaking away once we overlap these keys slightly. So at one second, 12 frames, we've got start and end values, both reading 100%. I'm then going to come to one second, five frames on the timeline, and I'm gonna move my first starting keyframe to one second, five frames. And then I'm going to move my second end keyframe to one second, six frames. And now as we stroke through, you'll see that that actually streaks across the screen. All right. So we've got our first end keyframe reading 0% on frame 24. First start keyframe reading 0% on one second, five frames. Second end keyframe reading 100% at one second, six frames. And then lastly, our second start keyframe reading 100% at one second, 12 frames. And that creates our streaking motion there. 
Okay. We can then close and lock streak one. We're finished with that. Let's then find streak two. So that's my second yellow streak up here. And I'm going to hit U for uniform to open up its keyframes. And let's take a look at our reference. This yellow streak fully disappears at one second, 10 frames. So I'll just move my marker there. And at one second, 10 frames, we're going to have start and end keys that both read 100%. We'll stagger these out a little bit as well. So I think for today, we're going to move our first starting keyframe to one second, four frames. And we'll have our second end keyframe at one second, five frames. So that's been staggered out there. I just want to see, did I apply easing to my keys? Yes, I did. So let's apply easing to our keyframes for streak two as well. We can close and lock both of those layers there. We're now done with those streaks. Next, we're going to do streak three. That's our top purple one up here. And if I remember correctly, both of the purple streaks disappear at one second, seven frames. So I'm just going to move my second timeline marker there. Okay. So with streak three selected, I'm going to hit U for uniform. I've already got my start and end keyframes. I'm just going to go ahead and apply easing to those. Then we're going to go to one second, seven frames and have both keyframes reading 100% there. And we'll stagger these ones out as well. So we're going to move our first starting keyframe to one second, two frames. And I think we'll put our second end keyframe on one second, three frames for today. Okay. So first end keyframe reading 0% is on frame 24. First start keyframe reading 0% is on one second, two frames. Second end keyframe reading 100% is on one second, three frames. And then finally, our second start keyframe reading 100% is on one second, seven frames. We can close and lock streak three. And let's finish up with streak four. That's our last purple streak here. Hitting U for uniform to bring up our keyframes. We've already got start and end sitting on frame 24. Let's apply easing to those. Coming on over to one second, seven frames. We'll then have both values reading 100. And I'm actually just going to open up my streak three layer just so I can see, I wanna have a little bit of overlap with these streaks so that they're not occurring at the same rate. So we're gonna move our first starting keyframe for streak four to one second, three frames. And we're also then going to move our second end keyframe to one second, four frames. So at least now it's not occurring at the exact same time as streak three. Okay. So my first end keyframe reading 0% is on frame 24. First start keyframe reading one second, uh, 0% is on one second, three frames. Second end keyframe reading 100% is on one second, four frames. And then finally, our second start keyframe reading 100% is on one second, seven frames. So if we then collapse and lock streak four, let's also save just in case. You'll now see that your reference footage is on layer five. We can leave it there for now. I'm just gonna turn off the visual reference. And you'll now see that as you play this back, we've got those lines streaking through there. Okay. Let's turn layer five back on. And next we need to do these donut shapes that scale out while they're moving and then they disappear in a little starburst formation. All right, so let's do these circles first. We're gonna come on over to one second. That's when these circles are at their smallest. And I'm gonna draw the left one first. So I'm gonna grab my ellipse tool. So we've got our rectangle tool immediately to the left of the pen tool. Click and hold and grab the ellipse tool there. We've already got the correct color set from our purple streaks. We can leave our point thickness at five. Holding down shift, I'm gonna click and drag to create a circle. And that will make a new shape layer for me. All right. We are then gonna hold down command or control and double click on the pan behind tool just to move our anchor point to the center of that circle. Very important for this layer. And we're gonna call this layer donut one. And I think we can color code it in dark green for today. All right. Then what we can do is before we start actually animating donut one, let's just duplicate it. So I'm going to hit command or control D 
you'll see then we now have donut 2 selected. And with my selection tool, I'm just going to click and drag that over to the correct position there. And we can deal with that later. Okay, so for donut 1, once again, we're going to have our position and scale keyframes on frame 24. So, and we're also going to have an opacity keyframe. So holding down shift and hitting T for opacity. We can then create our first keyframes for all of these. And on frame 24, opacity is going to read 0%. So right now our shape is invisible. Moving one frame to the right on one second, we are then going to have an opacity keyframe of 100%. We can apply easing to our position and scale keys. And let's then move down the timeline looking at our reference. Let's see when this purple donut disappears. So it moves towards the top left of the screen. It disappears entirely on 1 second 15 frames. So I'm just going to move my second marker to 1 second 15. And then I'll go back to 1 second 14 so I can actually just use this as a reference. I'm going to select donut 1, click and drag it out and just place it in the center of my reference. And I think I'll increase the scale to about 200% for today. We're also going to have an empty opacity keyframe. So on 1 second 14 frames, we're also going to have an opacity of 100%. Moving one frame to the right, we're going to have opacity of 0%. And we're also going to select our position and scale keys and shift them one frame to the right. As a rule of thumb, it's typically a good idea to have anything that's moving. If it needs to pop into view, make sure that it's already moving at least one frame before it's visible and make sure it's still moving one frame after it becomes invisible. And that way it just makes working with our graph editor a bit easier on getting the timing for that. Okay, so we've got our movement there for that donut. Grabbing both position and scale keyframes, we're then going to move into the graph editor and we're going to make sure that there's a nice peak occurring. Not too sharp, don't pull it all the way over, but just have a nice sort of steep shark fin peak there, which then has our shape move quite quickly and then ease into its final position before it disappears. Okay. And with that, we can leave the graph editor. Let's save and we can close and lock Donut 1. Coming over to donut two, we can see that the second donut disappears a little bit later down the timeline. That only disappears on one second 20 frames. So we're gonna move our second marker to one second 20. And let's create our first keyframes for donut two. So we need position, scale, and opacity keyframes. We're gonna make all of those first frames on frame 24. And our opacity is going to begin at 0%. We can also just preemptively apply easing to the position and scale keyframes. Moving one frame to the right at the one second mark, we're then going to have opacity at 100%. Then I'm going to go down the timeline to one second 19 frames. I'm going to make an empty opacity keyframe of 100%. And I'm going to click and drag my donut up to my reference footage and increase its scale also to 200%. So that has it then moving up there. Moving over to one second, 20 frames. We're going to grab our position and scale keyframes and shift them one frame over. So they're now sitting on one second, 20. And we're going to reduce our opacity to 0%. And that then has our shape shooting across and disappearing. We're going to grab position and scale and go into the graph editor. And once again, making sure that we have a nice peak over to the left hand side. That then has our shape shooting across and disappearing nicely there. Okay, let's save and close and lock our donut too. And then the last thing we need to do are these little star bursts that we see occurring once those donuts disappear. To make these a little bit easier to work with, I'm just gonna turn off the visibility for my two donut layers. And then we're gonna grab our pen tool once again making sure all our, our layers are locked and nothing is selected. With our pen tool, we're just going to click on our color box and grab the eyedrop tool. And let's sample the yellow from our uh, square once again. 
and then let's see when this first starburst disappears on the left hand side here. So it first appears on 1 second 14 frames, we can kind of just see it appearing over there. So I'm going to place my first timeline marker on 1 second 13 frames. That's where we'll have our first keyframes beginning. Then it disappears on 1 second 20. We can see that it grows quite large there. And we're going to be doing all of these strokes on one layer. So for streaks 1, 2, 3 and 4, because they were trimming away at different rates, they needed to be on their own layers. Because these four lines are going to be trimming at the same speed, we can have them inside of one layer. Here's how we go about making that. I'm just going to come on over to 1 second 15 frames where I can see this crosshair being formed essentially. And I'm going to click to create my first point. Moving down the timeline to 1 second 19 frames just so I can see how far this line needs to extend. I'll then click and create my second point there. Okay, so that makes shape layer one. We're going to go inside of shape layer one. Before we add trim paths, we're going to go into contents. And you're going to see that inside of contents, it says shape one. You can click on it and it gets highlighted in a slightly lighter gray there. We're going to duplicate this. So command or control D, you'll now see that you have a shape two selected. And with the pen tool, if I come on out and grab this furthest point here, I can click and drag and adjust that second shape that was just made to place its arm there. I'm then going to select shape two and hit command or control D and do the exact same thing with my pen tool, grab its furthest point and click and drag it out, placing it over our reference footage. And then finally we'll select shape three, hit command or control D to duplicate it once again and then using our pen tool, clicking and dragging the furthest point out to make my arm here. All right. So with those four lines now made, so we've got four shape layers inside of our main shape layer. Think of these as sub layers essentially from Illustrator inside of one main layer. What we can now do is we're gonna rename this main layer as Starburst One. I think we can color code it in cyan for today. And then before, once again, we add trim paths, we're just going to center our anchor point because you can see that that's still sitting up here in the center of the screen. So holding command or control and double clicking on the pan behind tool will then center that for us there. All right. Now we can add trim paths. So inside of our starburst layer, we can click on add and select trim paths that gets added to the bottom of our content stack. And going inside of that, we're going to make our first start and end keyframes on 1 second 13 frames. So we'll click our stopwatches there. And as you reduce the end value to 0%, you'll see that all four lines essentially stroke away there. Okay. Once that's done, we can then hit U for uniform to hide all that excess information. And we are simply going to apply easing to these keyframes here. Moving on over to 1 second 20 frames, we're going to then have a value of 100 and 100 for both. And then to stagger these out, what we're going to do is move our starting keyframe, first start keyframe to 1 second 16 frames, and our second end keyframe to 1 second 17 frames. Okay, so our first end keyframe reading 0% is on 1 second 13. Our first start keyframe reading 0% is on 1 second 16. Our second end keyframe reading 100% is on 1 second 17 frames. And then our second start keyframe reading 100% is on 1 second 20 frames. And we then have a starburst. Okay. We only need to make one more of these, but rather than drawing them all out again, what we're going to do is just simply duplicate Starburst 1. So I'm going to select Starburst 1 and hit Command or Control D to duplicate. That makes Starburst 2. I'm going to close and lock Starburst 1. Starburst 2, I'm going to grab with my selection tool and we're just going to move over here. Let's come down the timeline to about 1 second 19 frames, just so we can see the crosshair of our second Starburst there. And we're just going to click and drag our Starburst 2 to sit on top of that. 
All right. So if we plot out, I'm just going to turn off the visibility for Starburst 2 now so I can just see the reference below. That star first appears in our reference at 1 second 17 frames. So I'm just going to move my first timeline indicator to 1 second 16. And it disappears entirely at 1 second 24 frames. Okay. Now you'll notice that if we go to 1 second 23 frames that these lines extend a lot further than our initial drawn lines do. We're not going to increase the scale of the layer. Instead, we're going to go inside of Starburst 2 inside of contents and we're going to grab any one of these shape layers. In order to make adjustments to these lines, we need to have our pen tool selected. You'll see as soon as you grab the pen tool, we can see the little sort of interaction points here. And I can then just simply click and drag to adjust one line. But as soon as I try to adjust a second line, it's going to try and draw another path. So I need to reselect any one of the shape layers and then I can interact with the point. Essentially telling After Effects I want to adjust this line, not add a new one. So I'll select any one of these sub layers and adjust our second last arm there. And then I'll grab another one of the sub layers and adjust my final position there. All right, so now we've extended the length of these lines. Next thing we're going to do is hit U for uniform to bring up our keyframes. We've still got the keyframes that we had from Starburst 1. And if we kind of just shift those out, they only need a little bit of retiming. We'll do that and that, I believe. Turn on the visibility for my Starburst 2 layer again so I can see what that looks like. My very first end keyframe reading 0% is on 1 second 16 frames. My first start keyframe reading 0% is on 1 second 19 frames. My second end keyframe reading 100% is on 1 second 21 frames. And then lastly, my second start keyframe reading 100% is on 1 second 24 frames. And with that, we are done. Let's close and lock Starburst 2. Let's turn the visibility for our donuts back on. And right now our reference footage is sitting on layer nine. So I'm going to turn off its visibility so I can still see my actual shapes. I'm going to unlock my reference footage and just drag that to the top of the layer stack. Okay. And with that playing it back, we are finished with our animation. We've got everything that we need. Please do make sure to actually turn off your visual reference footage before you render. Otherwise, you're just sending it back to me for feedback. That's not going to work. Make sure to turn off the visual reference footage and send me your actual animation when you submit. Okay. And with that, we are done. Fantastic. Let's then just quickly talk about our homework, because I know there's been a couple of questions about that. And I'd like to clear it up for you guys as best as possible. Taking a look at our week five canvas page, because this has got our latest list of homework assignments. First thing, please remember to make the assets for next week's class. How you can go about doing that is downloading this reference footage. There is no tutorial for this. I have full faith that at this stage, you guys can start making your own things in Illustrator. So what I recommend doing is downloading this video footage, move yourself out to kind of where you can identify all of the shapes at the very end. So if I just blow that up here, Take a screenshot of that and put it inside Illustrator and then you can make your shapes on top of it. It'll make making these shapes a little bit easier for you guys. All right. Assignment three, that's what we've just done. So once you're finished with this uh, tutorial, render it out and submit to assignment three. Then we have assignment one, the poster. So you guys should have been working on the poster in the background now for the past couple of weeks. You should be working inside of Illustrator at this point, at least 25% done with your poster. You'll see that there are due dates for you guys. These are for an, uh, the next progress check on that poster. So you can either send me a JPEG or you can send me the actual Illustrator file for this assignment, but please make sure to submit it so I can see how far along you are with this poster process. Assignment two, that's what we did last week in class. So that was in week four. This is looking good so far, so please do continue to refine your animation, apply whatever feedback I give to you, resubmit, keep resubmitting until eventually the feedback says, great, no changes needed. Then lastly, we have the Illustrator class exercise and the assignment five 
exercise. Now these two have been combined together. That was the vote that we did in week four. So how this is working now is they're still at this stage being treated as two separate things. The first step is making sure that you submit your Illustrator class exercise file so that I can make sure that you've done the exercise properly and that your layers are set up correctly. Going over to that page quickly, all the tutorials that you need are here. Please, please, please make sure to submit this Illustrator file here as quickly as possible if you have not yet done that so that I can give you a green light to move on to the next step. The next step is then moving over to assignment five. Now, originally assignment five was us finding images of our own, um, making those images in Illustrator and then animating them for the personal animation. Because of the vote that we've held, we have now combined the Illustrator class exercise with assignment five. So instead of finding your own image for assignment five, you will be using the Illustrator file made for the class exercise. All right, so it's important that you submit that class exercise file so I can make sure that your layers are good and then we'll know that you'll be able to animate it for your personal animation. You'll see here that we've got some due dates for the planning document. If you guys remember back to week three, feel free to go back to the week three canvas page as well to see the example. We have the planning document, which is just a bunch of outlines over the image showing what's going to move, where would you place the anchor points, things like that. And uh, that document needs to be submitted by one of these days, depending on your class time. Let's jump on over to that assignment and see what happens here. Okay, so just reading through this, this assignment requires the students to apply the knowledge that they've gone in so far. There will be no tutorial, so make sure to spend time on your planning document. The more planning you put into it, the easier this process will be. So it is still going to be your personal animation. You're still going to be doing a nice idle animation using that file of about five seconds long. But please do submit that planning document first so that I can guarantee that you've given it some thought. Once you've submitted that planning document, I will then be in touch with you via email to book a contact session so that we can talk about that document. And then we're good. We're done with assignment five until we start working on it in week seven. All right, so the sooner we get those um, contact sessions done and out the way, the sooner we can just relax and then we'll start working on that file in week seven. Okay, so hopefully that's cleared up any confusion that you might have. If you have any further questions, you can always drop me an email. Otherwise, with that, have a great day further and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Ciao.